Hello to everyone. Good day to all of you out there, global wide. Welcome to my podcast, The Spirit Filled Life. This is your pastor, Yeti. Welcome to a new session. But first, I say to all of you, you are chosen. You are blessed. You are loved with an everlasting love. In God's creation, there is no one excluded. And so, all are welcome. The seeker. May you draw and find something that renews your life. Our next session in the spirit-filled life is the power of the produce. It's a little bit of a strange title, right, for a spirit-filled life. But anyway, nobody enjoys power-hungry people. I don't like it. They can be tyrannical. They threat everything and everybody as a means to their personal ends. They are driven by a desire to control their environment and everybody in it. They don't do well with authority. They can't be trusted. And they usually hurt the people closest to them. As you listen in just what I said, did any come to mind? Your boss, your father, a character in a movie, a business executive? Fill it in for yourself. It is easy to sit back and shake our heads this approvingly at the power hungry people of the world. But I believe they have a counterpart in the church. I'm not just talking about domineering pastors, deacons, and elders either. I'm referring to believers who are obsessed with the desire to harness the power of the Holy Spirit. On the surface, that may not sound like it's such a bad quality to have. After all, didn't Jesus send the Holy Spirit to empower believers? Shouldn't we learn how to activate this power within us? Wouldn't we be poor stewards to allow all of that potential to lie dormant within us? Wouldn't we be better off if we could tap into the inexhaustible ability of God? Questions such as these have a tendency to make us discontented. They make us think we are missing something that the Lord has made more available to us than we are taking advantage of. If you are not powerful, I mean if you are not careful, these questions will send you searching for the wrong answers in the wrong places. In my experience, I have found that people who talk repeatedly about activating or tapping into the power of the Holy Spirit talk very little about personal holiness. Their emphasis is usually on spectacular spiritual things such as healing, miracles, or tongues. There is something conspicuously 
self-centered about it. The Holy Spirit is treated like an errand boy rather than by the Holy God. Caution! Stay clear of any teacher, preacher, or anyone else who encourage you to do something, read something, or say something to harness the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's power cannot be harnessed. His power cannot be used to accomplish anything other than the Father's will. He is not a candy dispenser. He is not a vending machine. He is not a genie waiting for someone to make wishes. He is Holy God. People who are always looking for a way to direct or control the power of the Holy Spirit are confused. The Holy Spirit was sent to control us. He is not available, or she, as I explained a while ago, the Shekinah, the Hebrew for the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, or the Ruach, which is feminine. He or she is not available to do our binding, our bidding, I mean. The Holy Spirit is looking for surrendered believers to do His work. Notice what Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Acts 1 verse 8. The power of the Holy Spirit was given for a specific purpose, to enable us to be effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. The way some people talk about the power of the Holy Spirit, you will think it was given to make life easier for us. The Holy Spirit manifests His power in whatever way He deems necessary to enable believers to be effective witnesses for Christ. He is out to accomplish one thing and one thing only. That being the case, those who are persuaded of His cause can expect to see the power of the Holy Spirit manifested through their lives and those who are not will not. We cannot force His hand, not with faith, not with prayer, not with anything. He is God. We would do well to stop trying to harness His power and instead focus on allowing it to harness us. The power of the Holy Spirit is manifested in a believer's life through two channels. The gift of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. I will go there in the next session. First I want to look closely at the often overlooked relationship between the power of God and the fr fruits of the Spirit. One reason this relationship is overlooked involves the confusion surrounding the Holy Spirit power. When we think about power, we are prone to think about the blind being healed, the resurrection, the second coming, and so on. Our minds are catapulted into the realm of spectacles and miracles and consequently many are caught up in seeking these things but the purpose behind the holy spirit's power being made available to mankind was not a spectacle neither was it the performing of miracles for miracles sake 
His power was given for the express purpose of enabling believers to be more effective witnesses. If it means healing someone, he can handle that. If it means enable someone to clearly present the gospel, present the gospel, he can do that as well. But neither is any more or less a demonstration of his power. We must not allow ourselves to get caught up in pursuing spectacular evidence of the Holy Spirit's power. To do so is dangerous. In fact, when the people of his day asked Jesus about how they could harness the Lord's miraculous capabilities, he warned them against becoming unarmed with his ability to do the supernatural. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? John 6, 28. In his answer, Jesus pointed them away from the spectacular and back to the main focus. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent, John 6, 29. That didn't satisfy them. They wanted to see more miracles. They had lost sight of the purpose behind the actions Jesus was talking, was taking. So they tried to persuade him into performing another wonder. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. John 6, 30-31 Like so many of us today, they were sidetracked by the unusual. But Jesus refused to us his power, God's power to satisfy man's vain curiosity. Jesus pointed them back once again to the real issue, who he was, why he came, and how to enter into eternal life. John 6, 32-35 Jesus would not allow himself to be reduced to a circus act, and he will not allow it to happen today. Men and women who claim to be doing miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit, but who are doing it in such a way as to draw attention to the miracle rather than to Christ, are deceivers. Jesus wouldn't have a part of it then, and he will have no part of it now. From all what was said in the last session, one might mistakenly assume that the purpose of the fruit of the Spirit is merely to make us good people. That is certainly a nice byproduct, but there is more to it than that. The fruit of the Spirit is one of two channels to God, to which God releases his power in and through the believer. Whenever and wherever fruit is being produced, God's power is manifested. This power, as expressed through the fruit of the Spirit, enables us to be his witnesses in three ways. First, it attracts non-believers to the body of Christ. Second, it provides the relational qualities necessary to enable members of the body to work together in harmony. Three, it protects believers from the destructive consequences of sin. Nothing makes the kingdom of God more attractive to unbelievers than believers who lives our lives are characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. On the other hand, nothing is a greater stumbling block for non-Christians than believers whose lives are characterized by the deeds of the flesh, especially fleshly Christians who are always talking about Jesus. Jesus said it this way, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 
Matthew 5.15 The fruit of the Spirit is the most effective evangelic tool we have, evangelistic tool we have. Nothing is more powerful than a life characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The most powerful sermon in the world can't match the power of a fruit-filled life. Why? Because unbelievers are not nearly as impressed with what we believe and preach as they are with how we act, especially under pressure. If you don't think they are paying attention, just let out a string of profanity and watch their reactions. If it had been one of them, nothing would be said. But you, you are supposed to be a Christian, and the Christians don't talk that way. At least, unbelievers don't think so. Our light is not primarily in the words we say. It is in the life we live. A life filled with the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, is the most powerful sermon anyone can preach. It is a sermon that leaves critics dumbfounded. Peter says it, silences them. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human, institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 2, 13-15 In a world such as ours, a spirit-filled life is an anomaly. It doesn't make sense. It forces people to ask the all-important question, Why? Why won't you go with us? Why don't you fool around? Why didn't you take back at him? Why are you so faithful to her? Why don't you sue them? Why aren't you mad? The life, the life characterized by the fruit of the Spirit cannot help being noticed. It stands out like a candle in a dark room. It draws attention. It makes some people uncomfortable. It makes others downright mad. But it will consistently capture the curiosity of a few. There will always be a handful who say, there's something different about you. What is it? That's the power of the Holy Spirit in action, producing fruit, drawing men and women. In Jesus' farewell speech, he drew an interesting parallel between the power associated with the Holy Spirit and the unsaved. Acts 1, verse 8. As I mentioned earlier, the power of the Holy Spirit was directly associated with the group's commissioning as witnesses. In other words, they would receive the power they needed to be effective witnesses. Whatever it took to convince people, they would have the power to pull it off. Today, our world desperately needs to see men and women whose lives transcend the norm. The world needs to see husbands and wives really, really love each other. The world needs to see Christian businessmen and businesswomen who put honestly before profit and integrity ahead of paycheck. This generation needs to see teenagers and college students who haven't just said no to drugs, but who have said yes to a life of purity. Our world needs to see some fruit, real fruit, the kind that remains. If that is what the world needs to see, the Holy Spirit will bring it about by producing in through us. That is the promise of Acts 1 verse 8, to allow the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in our lives, 
is to serve us as a channel of his power. In that way, we become his witnesses because he knows the influence of a life that bears fruit. Whereas the gifts of the Spirit are for building up the body, Ephesians 4 verse 12, the fruit of the Spirit is a fragrance that invites non-believers to become members of the body. There is a second way in which the fruit of the Spirit serves a channel for the Holy Spirit's power. The fruit of the Spirit provides the rela relational qualities necessary to enable members of the body to work together successfully. As I mentioned earlier, the fruit of the Spirit is relationship-oriented. The body of Christ is one big bundle of relationships. It is made up of all sorts of people who are expected to work together to accomplish the purposes of God. For this is to take place, there must be fruit. In this sense, the fruit of the Spirit functions like oil in an engine. Without oil, an engine can run only for a short while. Eventually, the friction between the parts causes them to destroy each other, and the engine comes to a grinding halt. Sounds familiar? When believers who are not walking in the Spirit come together to carry on the work of the church, it is like running an engine with no oil. They have all the right parts, gifts, with no lubrication. There is going to be friction. Eventually, there will be a breakdown. We call them church splits. On the other hand, when a group of spirit-filled believers get together, there is a supernatural dynamic. The whole is significantly greater than the sum of its parts. Things happen that have no human explained. You can walk into their midst and feel the excitement and anticipation. It is the power of God, and it is being released as a result of their willingness to allow Him to produce His fruit in their lives. Our God loves to draw attention to fruit-bearing believers. Why? Because when men see our fruit, they glorify our Father in heaven. And there is a third way that the fruit of the Spirit serves as a channel for the Holy Spirit's power. The fruit of the Spirit protects us from the destructive forces of sin. We discussed this in detail in the last session I will give to you. It brings it up again only to emphasize the relationship between the power of God and the fruit of the Spirit. When you and I allow the Holy Spirit to produce in us the rare virtues of faithfulness and self-control, we allow Him to provide us with a powerful defense system. Of the nine qualities Paul lists, these two are the ones I need to most when temptation comes knocking. Consequently, I have a tendency to try to produce them on my own. Consistent victory in my life is never the result of my trying to become more self-controlled. Think about it. How can self be more self-controlled? Can a wild animal tam itself? Would a puppy ever give itself a bath? Of course not. These things run contrary to natural instinct. In the same way, self is never going to deprive self of something desirable. Victory comes when I focus not on becoming more self-controlled, but on the fruit of the Spirit. It is then, and only then, that self-control and faithfulness are produced in my life. The Holy Spirit wants to make you an effective witness for Christ. He is more than willing to manifest His power through you to do so. But first, two things must be true. First, you must be live willing to be used as a witness. And second, you must be bearing fruit. 
The Holy Spirit works through our fruit. He must have something to work with. Once these two elements are in place, watch out. You will be surprised and amazed by his power. You will catch yourself talking to people you would ordinarily be afraid to talk to. <coughs> You will walk through open doors that previously would have been frightening for you. Each one will be demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. He is ready. He is creative. He knows what is needed. He is simply waiting on us to make ourselves available. Now think about it. On a scale of ten to t on 1 to 10, how would you rate your witness for Jesus Christ? Do you tend to focus on the more spectacular demonstrations of the Holy Spirit's power or on what Jesus considers the main point? Who is who he is? Are you miraculously experiencing the power necessary to overcome temptation by focusing on the fruit of the Spirit? Is your life helping to provide the oil, thus enabling members of the body of Christ to work together successfully? Are you willing to be used as witness? Are you bearing fruit through the Holy Spirit? Well, there's a lot in this session, right? But we see here very clear what is the, in the power of people and through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's such an immense different. May you use and live what you just heard and also in the other sessions. Take it on. God is with you and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. For those who just came in, please start with the first session where you find ways to enable the indwelling that is given to you may the peace of God be with you and stays with you and may his light shines upon you and keep you safe God bless Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. This is your Pastor Yeti.